Thank you for joining us here on the Chris Spangle Show. It's great to be with you. My name is Chris Spangle. If you don't know anything about me, you can go check out all the details at chris-spangle.com. Make sure you sign up at chrisspangle.com. There's two webs. There's so many websites. Uh, before we start, I want to thank all of the members of Wall Plus here on the We Are Libertarians podcast network. You're the reason the network and show exist, and you can support the show by visiting joinwallplus.com. That's W-A-L-plus.com. Learn about all the great benefits of subscribing. Today, uh, you know, one thing we really like to do here on the program is check in with regular people and hear what's going on in their regular normal lives because what happens in the media normally is they take the the, the extreme ends of everything and pretend that's reality. And one thing that we like to dig in here on the network, on the show, or at least in my career, is What's it really like? What's government really like? What's it really like to be uh, an employee at a restaurant right now? And that's what today's show is about. My guest is Facebook friend, Zach Breath. Whoops. Zach Reth. Excuse me, I said breath. My, my pronunciation here says breath, and I, I read that instead. Uh, he's a restaurant manager, and, you know, he, he sent me a DM. Zach, you, you said, you know, if you ever want somebody on to talk about what it's been like to work in a restaurant during COVID and the lockdowns and kind of get that perspective, I'm available. And I said, let's do it. Let's talk because I'd love to hear what it's been like. So why don't you tell us sort of your career briefly in the restaurant industry and what that was like compared to what the last year has been like? Uh, absolutely. I uh, started off uh, waiting tables in college, uh, easy way to make money. Uh, got a chance to bartend uh, 21, um, fell in love immediately with it. Uh, I've never been married, no kids, so it fit my lifestyle very well. Uh, able to stay out late, you know, work late hours. Um, I moved up to Indianapolis and continued, continued doing that. Um, uh, worked a lot of high-end events, Super Bowl, Final Fours downtown. Um, uh, and then I moved forward, moved out to Los Angeles for a while, uh, came back to Indianapolis. And I've, I've done a little bit of everything uh, from – chain sport, sports restaurants to, you know, high-end dining, uh, everything in between. So uh, I've dedicated my life to this industry. I'm very proud of the work that I've done. So when COVID hit, I mean, I don't think there's any industry that probably maybe, I mean, to, like live events maybe, but the restaurant industry was hit so hard by the pandemic uh, and the lockdowns, which are two different things. Uh, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. But, you know, in, in March, April, what was your experience? Uh, March and April were, were very different than I think most people are feeling currently. Um, when, when it happened in March and April, it happened also fast, uh, especially with the states surrounding us getting rid of, uh, you know, shutting down their bars and restaurants. I think we all kind of felt it was coming at the time, uh, but understood what was at stake uh, at the original time of the pandemic when it started. Um, large gatherings, people in bars, uh, restaurants was probably not the safest thing. So we kind of understood that we needed to take a step back and do our part uh, for our communities, uh, which is something a lot of us in the industry thrive on, um, being part of a local uh, community. Uh, Let me community. touch on that because the vibe that I get from people talking about your industry is that you're all victims. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that was not my experience when it first started. Um, it was, at least from the, the uh, server and bartender perspective, a lot of us were on board on doing what we could do to control, um, especially when it was 15 days to flatten the curve. Right, uh, everybody was willing for 15 days. Once you get to 15 months, then like, all right, now we're pissed off, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a struggle. Um, you know, we've changed a lot of what we do. Uh, a lot of other places have gone to tip share uh, to try to incorporate more people getting hours. What does that mean, what does that mean? Uh, so instead of uh, being a server, instead of when you tip your table, instead of the server keeping that money directly, we pool all the money, uh, count the tips as a whole, and then divide it by hours work. Okay. And that, and that gives you your hourly rate. Um, so that's a lot of places have gone to that. Uh, that's really helped out. Um, you know, with so many places, Indianapolis have stepped up. Blend Cigar Bar was great with their employees right away. Uh, you know, Chris Long at Fork and Ale in Carmel did really nice things. It's one of the most hands-on owners I've had the privilege of knowing. I ate there last week while I was watching the Capitol be invaded. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it, Chris Long puts a really good work in, man. He, uh, 
he uh, has done a lot uh, for that place. It's a great location too. If you haven't been there, you should yeah. definitely go check that out. Um, it's uh, so we, we were all on board at the beginning and then it just kind of kept dragging. And at a certain point, we're worried about what our industry looks like five years from now at this point yeah. or a year from now. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the places that are only, I mean, even train, train restaurants are struggling, uh, but a lot of the local eateries are really, really hit hard um, uh, af- as this continues to drag on. Yeah, so there was a lot of, I saw a lot of businesses kind of adjust. There was one place that we frequented a lot in Fountain Square and they completely changed their outdoor dining and had a a totally different way to do everything. I mean, Chick-fil-A just has given up on indoor dining completely. Like look inside there, there, you know, I mean, what are some of the, the unique um, adjustments, the innovations that you've noticed around town and in the industry that you've heard about that you're like, all right, this is at least one positive because we've seen some innovation that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah, I would say online ordering. Um, in the last few, couple of years, a lot of places relied more on DoorDash and Uber Eats. They take a pretty large cut uh, of the order off top. Uh, it gives a very small margin. So I think a lot of uh, places have really pushed their own online ordering, which has helped bring revenue back into the restaurant that you're not spending on something else. Uh, places like Hotel Tango making hand sanitizer. Uh, uh, even places, you know, like 317 Burger and Broader Bowl really um, uh, attacking the to-go and the box lunch idea and giving new ways to get the product out there while keeping people fed and getting money uh, in people's pockets. Yeah, so, all right, that's some of the good. I mean, talk about some of the bad. And how much do you attribute to lockdowns and how much is just people's behavior changed because of the pandemic? I would say, man, that is a tough question, honestly. Um, I think that early on in the pandemic, some restaurants closed that uh, us in the industry knew we're going to close anyway. Whether we had a lockdown or a pandemic, they were trending that way. Um, I think some other places have had some ownership issues that have been attributed to COVID lockdowns. Um, On the other side, there are restaurants that are struggling daily um, to even pay bills, keep the rent on. Uh, closing down left and right. Uh, I think the number I saw was 20% is the estimate by the end of 2021 of all small businesses and restaurants are probably going to be closed. Uh, Mass Ave, uh, with the tourism down, especially in Indianapolis, downtown Indianapolis being such a destination place, it's a ghost town. It's not even the same vibe, uh, which I think is a big worry going forward that the uh, Indianapolis was a a very up and coming food city, great hospitality town, and we're losing a lot of that Uh, with this pandemic. So hopefully with things like March Madness coming back, we're going to be getting back to that vibe. Yeah. So if people don't know, I mean, Indianapolis is 1 million and then it's the 12th largest city and there's two and a half million total Metro. And the way that it's differentiated itself is through tourism, convention business, amateur and pro sports events. There's 80,000 hospitality jobs tied to that industry. And so the loss of all these conventions, like the firefighters convention and, and uh, Gen Con, the gaming convention and PopCon, some of these are, these are really big hits because all these people come to town and the way that you know, the city funds itself is through food and beverage taxes, hotel taxes. So residents don't pay a lot of taxes, it's out of town visitors. And that funds uh, city services, which are really like strained right now. And, you know, with that came, and it's a very walkable, safe city, a lot, you know, there's like a European feel and Mass Ave, Fountain Square, some of these places that Zach just mentioned have been really hit hard. I mean, it was really impressive the five years before the pandemic hit, how many, like, there's really no reason to go to Applebee's in this town. Because if you want to go to to get a nice, unique meal, you're within a 20, 30 minute drive, you know, from either Carmel or downtown to go get like a really, so chain restaurants don't do well here anymore because Zach, we've had so many cool restaurants to go to. I mean, how, how, how does that industry look going forward? I mean, do you think it bounces back this year as the vaccine starts to pick up or are you worried that, you know, you and all your brethren in the restaurant industry are kind of looking for hard times ahead. I think uh, in, especially with what's going on, um, we require tips to live. So there's been a lot of talent leave some smaller local places uh, to 
switch industries, to switch jobs, to even go to places where uh, move out of county, such as, you know, Hamilton County has much lower restrictions than Marion County does. Hmm. So people have transferred jobs. So the loss of talent to those restaurants is hard to uh, recoup uh, coming forward. Um, I think the biggest worry is that even with a vaccine, that people are still going to be hesitant to go out. Uh, I think the faster we get this vaccine out, the faster uh, a hospitality industry comes roaring back as it was before. As you said, chain restaurants don't do well in Indianapolis. Um, you know, from Josh Rodriguez down at uh, Thunder, uh, Thunderbird making amazing cocktails on that menu in Fountain Square to the food on Mass Ave and the way downtown is set up, we need the vaccine so people come back and enjoy what Indianapolis started to become known for which was our large hospitality industry and how good we were at it. How many restrictions kind of, I mean, because you just hit on an important metric that can help us judge lockdowns. I mean, I think we both agree. We talked about it off air that mm-hmm. lockdowns didn't do anything other than hurt jobs and, yeah. and didn't really protect people. Um, Hamilton County is north of Indianapolis. Carmel is one of the wealthiest cities in the country per capita. Uh, and, you know, I was, when I dined at fork and ale and caramel, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody and they were like, yeah, I mean, people come up here because there's not, there's not the 10 PM close off and you can kind of do what you want. And there's not the same level of restriction. So people are going out of the County. We saw that with smoking bans, you know, once Indianapolis put a smoking ban in effect, all of a sudden Hendricks County bars were packed. Uh, and so policy in one area can bleed over. So, you know, what, where is Indianapolis at in terms of restaurant restrictions? I still continue to go to restaurants. I will dine at the Great Ale Emporium tonight and have Hermanaki wings. Uh, I I tip generously, and now I tip I tip 25, 30% now when I go out. I mean, I personally haven't run into restrictions. Like, I haven't been able to do anything, but I also go to bed at like eight. So what <laughs> what what's what's it like? now i mean almost a year in do we still have a lot of restrictions uh, there's still uh, the capacity kind of things uh, that people are trying to follow uh, in the, specifically in indianapolis in marion county uh there are you know people are adapting to it so we are getting business coming back in uh just with the capacity restriction is the big thing right now yeah. um and that's a big part of the atmosphere <laughs> in a restaurant I nope. stood outside. Yeah, I stood outside of a BW3s that had nobody in it, and they're like, "Yeah, we're at twenty five percent. We can't let yeah. you in." I'm, yeah, and, the, and every other place was closed. It's like, all right, well, I'll just go home. Yeah, and I think a lot of us, like I said at the beginning of this, we were willing to give our sacrifice and do what we need to do because we are such a large part of the community. Uh, I don't know a single server, or bartender, busser, kitchen staff that doesn't uh, frequent other local restaurants uh, when we get off work or you know, enjoy those kind of things. And we, that's all been taken away from us as well. Mm. Uh, we don't have that extra money to spend going out. We don't have, you know, the access to the place we want to go. Um, I, I've been very sad. I haven't got to go back to the Alley Cat in Broderville. I'm afraid to see what that looks like at 25% capacity. Uh, so a lot of these places thrive on atmosphere. The busier they are, the better it feels in there. And mm. a lot of places just kind of feel ghostly, uh, kind of this ominous feeling around them. Um, and, it, I think that's kind of been stigmatized with some of the, you know, misinformation about how much restaurants were spreading and, uh, and that those numbers have continued to go down. And we see that that's not, we're not super spreader places. So it's been frustrating uh, more than anything, um, just dealing with the, the stigma of restaurants from a lot of people who were very pro lockdown and still are. Uh, they don't see the impact that's having on a day-to-day life uh, where we're trying to do what we can uh, to follow these guidelines, but sometimes the, it just, it feels like a cloud over the, over the establishment. Yeah. I mean, to me, I, I mean, I was all for stay home voluntarily for 15 days, uh, yeah, like, absolutely, yeah, you know, but by July, I'm like, I'm going to Florida. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, yeah. like it's obvious that it was, that it's very serious. There's obviously a lot of people dying, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, not I'm, you know, like we're not Florida. downplaying any of that, yeah. but like at the same time, like, where's the line between living your life? I mean, you just touched on some of that misinformation because I talked to some family members who were just like, we haven't been in a restaurant in an entire year and we're not going back because of what you said. Like, I'm like, I've been going to restaurants like every week. Like I'm alive. 
You know, I mean, so what, what was some of that misinformation that people may not totally understand? I mean, granted, you're not an epidemiologist, but you're obviously following this closely because your pocketbook. Yeah, I, uh, I would say I think people miss um, are misinformed about the sanitation and cleaning that we do that we did before the pandemic mm-hmm. and how much, uh, you know, how the safe serve safe guidelines and our, uh, you know, the health code guidelines, and how strict those are and how I don't know a single restaurant that doesn't follow those as closely as they can. So when the extra uh, precautions came out, we immediately took those as well. You know, we uh, there's hand sanitizer at almost every table in almost any place that I've seen. Um, there are uh, you know, mass requirements, the bathrooms usually. Uh, if it's a smaller bathroom, I've seen people close it and only allow one person in at a time to, you know, keep that distance, uh, that social distancing. So I, we do everything I, we can to make sure our food is clean. Um, we saw what, you know, a... Uh, uh, an outbreak of something like E. coli did to Qdoba. Um, right. And so we take our, those extra precautions anyway. Now we're doing even more of that. Chipotle, I think. Uh, yeah. Chipotle, yes. yes. Chipotle is the superior to Qdoba, but let's not, <laughs> let's not. This and I mean, I, I'm sure uh, their food is completely safe now, I'm sure. I'm just pointing out how that those kind of stories can affect a place in the long term. This has been one of my arguments to pro-lockdown people is that you don't need the lockdowns. You don't need the government intervention. That's just going to create uneven outcomes that don't work. But, you know, the the security system is that people like you care about your customers and will take every precaution. And then the people who are worried are going to stay home. And instead of having that extra 10 to 20% closures of business and job loss or whatever it may be, you know, let the market take care of that. I mean, have you run, have you heard stories of people just like, like we walked into one restaurant and they didn't care about COVID at all. And we just didn't go back. Right. Like, you know, I want to go where there's some social distancing, where the restaurant is giving some hoot about this. Like, but have you heard of people who are just like bad actors and what percentage of restaurants is that? Uh, I would say it's very small percentage. I think, um, you know, there were people at the beginning who are, you know, this is my business, I'm staying open. And as it became more serious, they realized they needed to stick to close and do those things. I have not personally seen um, any restaurant that is just egregiously ignoring any COVID restrictions at all. Is um, that because they don't want to break the law or because they're trying to do the right thing? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, okay. I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of both, definitely. Um, I think we follow the law because it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a, a nice thing to do in society, especially when it has reasoning behind it. And uh, I think on top of taking care of people, that was something that it just kind of melded together. Uh, so personally, I haven't seen any restaurant that is just blatantly ignoring any restrictions or any precautions, take, not taking any precautions. I feel for people who wear, I can't wear a mask for more than like an hour before. Like I, I partially just stay home so much because I don't want to wear the mask. Yeah. I think that's eight eight hours running food. It it gets a little rough uh, with that mask on. I just Um, want to say, God bless you. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I will say, I, you know, at at places uh, that require masks, I've seen, you know, uh, fellow employees get called out for, you know, even pulling the mask down for a couple minutes being like, Hey man, get that back up. Even if you're in the back. So we, we definitely take take it seriously. We're doing everything we can to help the situation while still trying to maintain our livelihoods. So I want to talk about, you know, I, you don't mention your personal income, but like, can you give people an idea of both yourself and other folks that you talk to in the industry? Like how much has this financially impacted you? A lot, definitely a, a lot. Um, you know, I think some of the help that came uh, through the federal assistance uh definitely helped a lot. I think what was most amazing to me was um, the way a lot of the people around the industry, like our landlords and those kind of people immediately responded for us. Uh, the day we found out the restaurants were closing, uh, my landlord knows me, my fiance are both in the industry, called us that day and told us, hey, we'll figure it out when we figure it out. Um, oh, so nice. yeah, there. I think the, the, the help that came from around us uh, was, was a greater response than anything I've seen, uh, but I will say a lot of people are struggling uh, financially in the industry. It's a uh, squeak by time. Uh, I, a lot of us are used to feast or famine, uh, living off tips. You know, there's big times to make tips and, and, and times you don't make any tips. And it's been famine for far too long in times that we usually make a lot of money. Is it um, 
50% income drop, 10%, 80% for, for people? Is it, In the beginning, was it 100% and now it's 20% of what you made a year ago? I would say at the beginning, it was definitely 100 At least for my, me personally, where I worked, we shut down. Uh, I was out of work for a couple months. Um, uh, I would say it's about 25% less than I made last year. Uh, and it's definitely more close to like 40% less than I've made in years prior um, as well. So when you hear stuff about like the $15 minimum wage increase, I mean, I know restaurant workers make $2.13 and you live off of tips. I mean, moving forward economically, not advocating government solutions necessarily, but, you know, restaurants taking care of their employees, what would, what would you like to see? I mean, I've, I've heard talk about eradicating tips, going to salaried employees, raising minimum wages, raising that two thirteen, like, what ideas would you like to see out of restaurant owners that would make your job easier knowing that we may face other pandemics or other crises? Uh, I think, you know, the $15 minimum wage, um, from my experience, the restaurants I've worked in, uh, anyone worth their salt in the back of the house, uh, line cooks, uh, you know, expo, that kind of thing, uh, they already make about $15 an hour. So that's not a huge jump. Uh, front of house employees, especially in Indiana, um, you know, we love our tips. We love the 213. Um, I do feel like most of us agree that should be raised a little bit, but we do. Again, most of us get paychecks that have zero dollars on them. If you would like to talk to these three of your bartender friends, we get our pay stubs, literally zero dollars. And then somehow we still end up owing more in taxes most of the time um, after that. Uh, but I will say, uh, I think moving forward, the issues in our industry are more uh, access to health care, access to uh, sick time off, um, access to uh, mental health coverage, and especially addiction, which is rampant in my industry. Uh, those things don't come with our job. Uh, you know, we make really good money, uh, but that doesn't come with any help on the outside, no health care costs or anything like that. And we're not usually offered affordable health care, uh, especially with the limitations uh, of employers uh, offering it to us. Um, you know, very few jobs that people have, if you miss two days, you might not be able to pay your rent. And if you're sick on a Friday and a Saturday, or you have a child that's sick on a Friday or a Saturday, a uh, family emergency, that is going to take a huge chunk of your income away immediately. Um, and some of the protections, you know, you brought up salary and getting rid of tips. Uh, I think tip share is probably, like I talked about earlier, is probably a better uh, maybe forward solution uh, to making sure that everyone feels included and that the restaurant works as a whole. Um, the problem with, uh, with the salary is just the amount of work it takes uh, from prep to close to do a restaurant. You would end up, uh, I feel, with a very short staff doing a bunch of work for a very long time. And this job is not built for that. This job is not very conducive to eight to 10 hour shifts just because it's so emotionally draining uh, dealing with customers and having to perform constantly as well as you know, the, the menu knowledge, the soft skills it takes uh, to be good at this job, it can be draining after about a six hour shift. Um, so is that why the tips, the tips thing remains is that the margins for restaurants are so small because of food spoilage and unreliable workforce often that employers can't afford to run it like, you know, like, a, let's say you ran a, I don't want to say normal business, but you know, where everybody, you, you bring somebody on part-time, full-time, pay them the minimum wage, whatever. Yeah. They, they rely on the tips because you that that's the only way to financially make a restaurant work. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's the only way to get people that want to work there. Um, uh, I don't know anyone who wants to make tips that is happy with anything less than 20 to 22 dollars an hour um, at peak times. Um, that but we earn that money, you know, it's it's not an hourly wage, but that's what we end up getting after our tips. That's the amount of time we put in. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it would be difficult to get people to get rid of tips completely. I think tip share is a more viable option. Um, you know, gratuity is a great way uh, to really show people they're good at something that not a lot of people are that great at and not a lot of people can do, um, you know, make a career in this industry. And Indianapolis was on its way to being one of those cities like Nashville, uh, like Louisville, Kentucky, where you could make a career in this industry and really not have to move far from home. Uh, but that has taken a big hit uh, through the pandemic. Uh, so moving forward, I would like you know, restaurant owners to really kind of start uh, looking at mental health coverage, medical coverage, and you know, some, some sick pay uh, for employees that would benefit the workforce as a whole. Um, and whether that is intervention through the government, which you know, is not always the greatest idea, uh, or some kind of uh, action taken by employers. But those are the three things I would say moving forward in the pandemic 
um, that are more pertinent than a $15 minimum wage. Those I mean, people. if I had to pay an extra $2 for my cheeseburger you know, <laughs> to, to, yeah. to help fund that stuff, I'd totally be down for that. Exactly. I mean, That's you know, I, I think most people are like, hey, we, we offer this stuff to our employees. Not only are you going to want the best talent working for you, I'd, I'm okay paying a little more. Like, you know, I, 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 so hopefully that, that catches on. Maybe we've started a revolution here today, Zach. <laughs> I know it's a, it's been a big talk in the industry for a while about tip share and, and you know the protections we need as workers. Uh, there's especially with the 213 side work is something you do before and after a shift. And there's a lawsuit against a fairly large restaurant here in Indianapolis um, where restaurants take advantage of that. You know uh, they don't they know you're going to make more than the minimum wage on the tips, which is how the 213 works against minimum wage. So then they you know ask you to roll silverware for 45 minutes to an hour when you're not making any actual tip money at that point. So there are some protections that need to be put in place, but mental health care, uh, mental health coverage, addiction, and health care in general are probably the three things that face our, our industry faces the biggest challenges moving forward. Final thing, what, is, what, what would you like everybody to understand that you just see on a daily basis or that you're going through that you kind of see people talk about this thing on Facebook and, and all this stuff that you just go, God, people don't get this. Yeah, uh, I would say the biggest thing I want to hit on uh, to help local restaurants is avoid using DoorDash, Uber Eats, any large conglomerate uh, food ordering service. It may take you eight to 12 minutes to go pick it up yourself, uh, but that is usually 25 to 30 percent that that restaurant immediately gets put back in uh, mm -hmm. that they don't have to pay to DoorDash or Grubhub off the top. Uh, then if your order gets messed up, that's usually the margin of error. So if your order gets messed up on one of those and we have to remake it, that's essentially at cost at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, just tip like they might not have a job in a week uh, because that's a legit possibility for a lot of us right now. Zach Reth, restaurant manager here locally. Uh, thank you so much for being on. I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Chris Spangle Show and we'll see you tomorrow.